we are looking at the channel response of sign equalization. Basically, the, because the channel response is low pass, we need to have a high pass response to undo the effect of the channel. Ideally, if you have an equalizer whose uh, frequency response is by the inverse of the channel response, it's like having no channel. So you just have a delay and whatever you get out of it, uh, what you put in. Of course, although this is in principle okay, we cannot really do this in practice because of a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the channel response may be too complicated to find the exact inverse and equalizer. It has an artist and so on, which means the inverse will have to have infinite gain that cannot be realized at all. Now, uh, as we'll see, even if you can realize the inverse, that is probably not something what you want to do. Okay, this is without a short talk. Short talk which uh, speaks at high frequencies will also get amplified by the equalizer. So, so beyond some point, this linear equalization does work. So first we look at linear equalizers, look at the limitations, and then there is one particular type of nonlinear equalizer which is very popular. We will look at that as well. Basically, equalization refers to having some transfer function either in the receiver or in the transmitter of both. Okay. And after that, we will make the decision. That's the idea. Okay. And we'll also have a clock and data recovery circuit. Now first let's look at how we will be how we'll make the receiver transfer equalizer and what are the limitations we have. Okay. So we already saw that if you <coughs> think in the continuous uh, time Continuous frequency domain, the channel response will be something like this. So, the equalizer response should have the opposite behavior so that the product of these two becomes something like this. You don't need it to be exactly flat, you know that we can tolerate a little bit of low pass response, right? As long as the bandwidth is higher than 75% of the data rate, it is okay. So, we have to boost it, but we don't have to equalize it to exact flat. But it's very clear that if uh, the channel response starts becoming more and more low pass, that is, it has more and more high frequency estimation, you have to provide more and more high frequency gain. Okay. So that's one way to think about this. This is in the frequency domain. Alternatively, you can think of it in the time domain. The impulse response of the channel looks something like that. The sample impulse response. Okay. Here I don't mean the, uh, sorry, this is not the sample impulse response, what I meant was something else. The unit pulse response of the channel. This is what it looks like. And to equalize this, we know that we need some response like this. If we had only two taps, if uh, this was one and this was A, I would make this one and this one minus A. Okay, something like this. So we'll have a, a two tap response. This has to be implemented in discrete time. Okay. Now, how do we implement these things? First of all, typically it turns out that this continuous time equalizer is what we implement in the receiver. Okay. Because it comes immediately after the channel. We have assumed that we have not yet sampled the data. So we can't use this uh, discrete time technique here, right? There is no sample data available. So we have to use the continuous time equalizer. And it's also a good thing in that uh, the good part about it is it's a continuous time equalizer, 
So it doesn't depend on the sampling part of it. We know that the sampling in the receiver comes from clock and data recovery circuit, right? That's what tells you where the sample is. Now, this continuous time uh, equalizer in the receiver, this is independent of the timing, okay? So, uh, if it was dependent on the timing, you have to worry about whether that thing will start up correctly so that you can equalize and so on. There can be some conflict. So, this will provide some equalization independently of it because this is a continuous time equalizer. All it does is gives you the inverse response of the channel, okay? And uh, because we are talking about very high frequencies and so on, the type of transfer functions we realize in the continuous time equalizer is somewhat limited, okay? Typically, it is limited to a single zero. And I'll show it as a single pole. You anyway know that we can't have only one plus S plus Z1 without an accompanying pole, right? This, can't, this is not possible. And frequently, you have more poles as well, okay? Now, how do you do this? Typically, the way it is done is to use what is known as capacitive source degeneration. I think you know what source degeneration is, right? What is it? You have a resistor at the source. So basically, the overall transconductance becomes determined more, more by the resistor and not by the transistor. Okay? So this is degeneration. If this is GM, what is the effective transconductance? GM 1 plus GMR. Assuming GMR is very high, it will be approximately 1 by R. That was the idea. Now, what we want to do is, we want a high pass type of behavior. That means that we should have a transconductance that is increasing in frequency. So, what should we do? Yeah. So, what is done is, uh, you have additionally a capacitor. Okay. So in parallel with this R, you have a capacitor. So why does it increase the gain at high frequencies? What happens here? If you have a, if you have R, you have Z, whose impedance goes on decreasing its frequency. So you have a gain that is increasing the frequency. Okay. So, and if you want to sketch the body plot of this, what do you have? Magnitude of uh, ID by VI, and you want to plot it versus omega. What will that look like? What is it at very low frequencies? Yeah, it will be constant, but what is the value? GMI or the GMR, obviously, because if the capacitor is not there, it's a regular source generated stuff. So at least low frequencies, it is uh, GMI 1 plus GMR. What is it at very high frequencies? Huh? Ah, at very high frequencies, what will it be? GM, because this capacitor becomes a short, you have a regular common source amplifier. So this is GM. Okay. And then clearly, if you have something like this, you know that there is a zero and a four, right? In the middle. So what is the frequency of the pole? I mean, we can derive this. I mean, this is quite easy, but I, I think this kind of stuff you should also be able to tell by inspection. How do you find out the pole frequency? We are looking at a first order system here, right? GM by C. Or more precisely, what is it? Yeah, so it's basically GM plus 1 over R divided by C. That will be the pole frequency. And what will be the zero? You can actually calculate it because this is the first order system. You know 
these values and this has to come down proportionate to this frequency so you can find out if this falls off as first order and it is into sex what is it but anyway it turns out to be what huh? one by r okay so it will be one by r that is basically the frequency at which the uh, impedance of the parallel combination starts changing right so anyway this can be quite easily derived all you have to do is to substitute r by z where z is r by 1 plus uh, s e r okay so that's all that's that right? so this is what you get This is fine. So this is the this is typically what is used for equalization. Now our implementations are usually fully differential. So what ends up happening is we'll use a differential pair with the degeneration. Current is I naught and I naught. This will be I naught plus some uh, ID. This will be I naught minus some ID. Okay. And if I just for ease of notation, I'll call this 2R and D by 2. So what will be ID by VI? ID by VI and the Laplace domain. Huh? Yeah, it's basically half of uh, GM by 1 plus. VI is the differential voltage. Okay? So it will be half of uh, Now, this is like a differential uh, amplifier now, but the amplifier's gain is frequency dependent. And I have RL here. What is the output voltage VO? What will that be? Yeah, it will be basically this time. Two times RL. Okay, so it will be where Z is the same thing, right? So this will come out to be DC gain will be GMRL by 1 plus GMR. Okay. So that's pretty obvious. Like if it's capacitors not there, that's what you get. And at high frequencies, what is the gain? It's just GMRL. Okay. This is fine. This is known as a continuous time linear equalizer. Or CTL for cross. Okay.
Now, uh, we not only need uh, equalization, the amount of equalization may not be variable depending on the length of the channel and so on. How would you vary the amount of equalization here? What would you have to change? Let's say you want the programmable amount of equalization. What do you have to do? By the way, one thing I have to point out is uh, we will have parasitic capacitors here for sure. Okay. So the response of the whole thing will be. Uh, This is the DC gain, and this is the zero because of capacitor degeneration, and this is the pole, term corresponding to the pole. On top of it, combination of RL and the CP, right, this gives you another pole, okay? So like I said, you will have at least two poles, if not more. The exact shape depends on where the two poles are in relation to the zero. But I'll uh, just draw, I'll show it with widely separated poles just for uh, illustration. So we start with some DC gain and we have the zero value. And I don't know whether this pole appears before that or after or is it all the uh, same. So We'll have something like that and something like that. Okay. So we have two poles. Okay. Now, uh, as, so assuming that there is this flat region, if the two poles come together, then you will not see any flat region, it will just be turned on. Okay. Now, this is the the DC gain is GMRL by 1 plus GMRE and this amount is the high frequency boost that you have, okay? How much is this? What is the gain factor that you see? One plus GMR, yeah, assuming you see the flat region, it will be So you can essentially, now this is supposed to equalize the channel which is falling off like that and let me assume that this corresponds to half the data rate, okay? I mean, like I said, a crude way of measuring the effect of the channel is to look at the definition of half the data rate and at the half the data rate, the amount of boost has to be, let's say, equal to that. I mean, you may not make it exactly equal, but you get the idea. So, now you can see, I mean, the largest value of 1 plus GMR you can realize is the largest amount of boost that you can give. Okay, you cannot get very high gain at high frequency. Maybe 20 dB is about the maximum and that's all okay. So, essentially, this, uh, the ratio of uh, the peak gain to the DC gain, that is the boost, okay. Now, how can you change this? You can change either the capacitor or the resistor actually. So, you can typically you also have these elements to be programmable. And you also make this programmable just to change the gain. Okay.
So this many times is used. And then you may have preset it to certain amount of visualization. The virtue of this is it works independently of other things. It doesn't need clock and all that stuff. So it will open the eye opening by a it will open the eye by a certain amount without relying on anything else. Okay. This is fine. The circuit itself is quite simple. There may be some minor variants of this that uh, you may use. Actually, uh, these two current sources you can put at either end, or you can split this uh, R and C into two series components and then put it in the middle. That would actually be better for noise, okay? Because there the noise from the current source will be purely common mode, whereas here you have differential mode noise. But on the other hand, if you do that, uh, there will be some common mode drop across the resistor, DC drop across the resistor. So with the lower supply voltages that we have, it is harder to accommodate noise. So that's why we use something like this, although this is worse for noise. Okay? The better alternative for noise would have been Okay. That's the advantage. Uh, disadvantage is it needs the higher supply. Okay. Any questions? So once you know what channel you have, you will make this and if you have a variety of channels, you can simulate all of them, see the amount of boost that you need and then adjust the programmable components to give you that kind of boost. You may also have variable gain just to be able to deal with different values of input signals. Okay. Now one thing is of course, uh, this equalizer is a linear equalizer. So that means that the input amplitude must be small enough so that this whole thing works in a uh, approximately linear form, the small signal linear range, right? So you can apply voltages for a few hundred millivolts, but not beyond. Right? I mean, it basically depends on how much degeneration you have. Is it okay? Now, instead of in continuous time, you can do this in uh, also in discrete time. Okay. So, there are a couple of ways of doing that in the receiver. So, first, You sample the signal, pass it through an EDC, and do everything in the digital domain. Okay. So this is done sometimes. Uh, in fact, at very high speeds also, now this is becoming the preferred way of doing things. Another possibility is, but the only thing is, I mean, this type of stuff is not likely to be power efficient because the ADC working at that rate is going to consume a lot of power. And if you are operating at 10 gigabits per second, you need at least the 10 gigabits ADC, right? Uh, because most of the energy of the 10 gigabits per second signal is at 5 gigahertz or below. So at 10 gigahertz ADC, I may be a little bit beyond that expectation. But people are, in fact, trying to do these things. Uh, even at even higher speed, uh, let's say 32 gigabits per second and so on. The reason is, once you do have the stuff in digital, you can uh, use very complicated algorithms. But this is likely to be quite power hungry. Okay?
So another possibility for discrete time stuff is just to use, let's say, sample and hold. You sample it, and then you use basically analog delays. Analog delays meaning if you have a cascade of sample and holds, the successive, I mean, in the successive stages, you get further and further delayed samples, right? This is just like if you have a say, chain of deep flow uh, down the chain, you will get delayed bits, okay? <coughs> so this can be done, and then you can have a weighted summation of uh, these things. So implement a discrete time filter. So this is this was used for some things, but actually this is, uh, as far as I know, not used very widely. If you can sample the signal very well, maybe then you can go into digital and do it. Or uh, I mean, this discrete time analog is also not very easy to build. You have to have a chain of sample and all stages and so on. Okay? And of course, the sampling instant has to come from the clock and data recovery circuit. That's the only way, right? So, it is somewhat complex. It is in principle possible, but we don't do, do it as often. So, you need linear analog sample and hold, and this linear amplifier to do. Okay. But there is one form of uh, discrete time equalization which is used very widely and in fact it's very effective. That is in the transmitter. Okay. So discrete time uh, equalization, basically implementing an FIR filter, is used in the transmitter very widely. Why is, why is it easier in the transmitter than the receiver? What do you think it is? Sample? Not affected by? Okay, that's true. No, the most important reason is, like how do you make, uh, so to make an FIS filter, what you need is a bunch of delays, right? And summation. Okay. So in the receiver, what is it that you have to delay? You have to delay the received analog signal. In the transmitter, the digital bits, right? Basically, the transmitter is uh, sending digital bits. So the signal is actually in a very simple form. When it goes through the channel, goes through all this attenuation, it becomes a really a continuous value signal. Okay. Otherwise, in the transmitter, it's just a binary or maybe four value signal, right? So, because it's a digital signal, it's very easy to implement delays. How do you implement delays for a digital signal? Flip-flops, right? Flip-flops are certainly easier to make correctly than a sample and hold which preserves the value, right? Because a sample and hold will have its own attenuation, distortion, all these things. Whereas, a digital uh, bit can be delayed easily using a flip-flop, right? This is because... Digital bits in the transmitter can be delayed easily using flip flop. Okay? So that's why if you have some set of bits AK, right? And let's say I need to implement a filter of the form. This is the cursor H0. H minus 1 is the precursor, basically it belongs to the future bit. And H1 is the fourth cursor, it belongs to the previous bit. Okay? So, how would I do it? I basically have to have I need a, I'll show a chain of three flip flops. I mean, I need only two delays, right? I can sum this one and that one. But the flip flops will be there for clocking anyway. So I'll show a chain of three flip flops. You understand? Right? So then I have this clock. Okay. 
Okay. So if I call this the cursor, if this is the okay. So this is the future bit x01, and this is the past bit x minus one. Okay. And I need to wait and I need to take a wait some x now. And this is known as a semi digital implementation of the FIR filter. Semi digital meaning the delays are actually digital delays, they are not analog. Okay? This fine? So, because this is so easy to do, this is done uh, quite widely, this does have some disadvantages as well. Now, first of all, uh, and I mean, you can change the weights, which is S minus 1, S0, H1. So, you can change the weights of all these things. Changing the weights of H minus 1 and H1, you change the amount of equalization. If you set H minus 1 and H1 to 0, you have no equalization, you just have the cursor. And if you adjust the amount of H minus 1 and H1, you can get different amounts of equilibrium. Okay? And H0 also you can change if you want to change the transmitted amplitude. Right? So H0 just is changing the transmitted amplitude. Okay? This is fine. Now, how do we implement this? This implementation, this weighted summation, like one of the popular ways of making the transmitter is the following. I mean, I'll assume that our transmission channel is differential, that is, you have a pair of lines going from here to there. So, one of the ways of uh, making the transmitter is just to use a differential pair. And this output goes to the channel. Okay. At these high speeds, the everything tends to be different. Okay. Now, what is this driven by? This is driven by the digital bit. So again, we can have a flip flop that is fully differential also. I mean, the uh, pseudo differential or fully differential, we can do that, and that's what happens. So we'll have a flip flop. This will be the Q1, Q bar of the system. Okay? And this is clocked by some clock. At the rising end of the clock, these things change, and you'll have a change bit. And this, uh, this voltage at the input of the channel, I mean, assuming that, let's say the channel presents some R0, will be basically, what is that? What is it going to be? It will be basically I naught times it will be the, the value will be plus I naught times what? If R naught is infinity, it will just be plus I naught R. Okay? If R naught is not infinity, what is it going to be? Yeah. So it I naught R is the open circuit voltage and then it will be. Okay. I think that's what it will be. Okay. Check that. So you will send uh, some amplitude. Basically, this is just a scaling, right? You will send either plus that voltage or minus that voltage. Okay. This is clear. And by changing I naught, you can change the gain or basically the transmitted amplitude. 
So it's easy to change this. You can have a number of parallel current sources which you turn on and off, and you can program the transmitted amplitude. Now, how will you implement the uh, how will you implement equalization in a transmitter like this? What do you have to do? Inputs of the inputs of the diffusion will come from the summer. But in uh, how, how is this diffusion operating actually? In what region is it operating? So this is being uh, driven by large digital signal. So basically, it's operating like a switch, not like a differential pair amplifier. Okay, that is if Q is higher than Q is one and Q bar is zero. So this is completely switched to one side. And all of the current goes this way. And similarly, if Q is zero and Q bar is one, all of the current goes that way. That's the idea. Okay, so it operates like a switch. So even if you implement the summation and apply those signals here, you will not get the effect of the summation because this is normal. So what do you do? Huh? Basically, this is like a this is what is known as a current. Driver, right? The transmitter, a differential pair is actually outputting a current, plus minus I naught. Okay, and you can do current summation by putting things in parallel. So what you do is the following: you will have, let's say, the terminating resistors, and these. Come from now more than one differential pair. That's all. And where do these come from? So you have a deep flip flop. I'll show a single unit connection like this, but the flip flops themselves are typically differential also. Okay. Uh, okay. So all these are driven by the same clock. Right. So the delayed bits are driving the different flip flops. This is the, these are the outputs. So basically, current summation, that's again easy by connecting uh, multiple different pairs to a node, you just add up the currents. Okay? How will you adjust the weights? Yeah, basically by changing the tail current because all of them, these are digital switches, right? The differential pairs of switches. They will switch whatever current you provide from there. So the cursor is proportional to this I naught. 
precursor is proportional to this i minus 1 and force cursor is proportional to i1 okay so by adjusting the value programming the values of current you can also easily program the weights of the fir filter is it okay by the way uh, i have showed it like this but the precursor and force cursor elements in the equalizer are frequently negative okay you only need negative weights this is because a low pass filter's response is usually the low pass filter what it does is to tend to spread the response okay so that is the precursor and post cursors of the channel will be positive for the equalizer they should be negative so that they get cancelled out of course far away from this if you look at uh, many elements later because of reflections and so on even the channel response could be negative but the ones immediately around the cursor will be positive in a low pass response okay because that's what low pass means it doesn't change immediately right so you have a positive value and then that stays on for a long time so here uh, for the at least for the first immediate pre and post cursor you will have to implement a negative weight uh, you don't have to usually change it to a positive weight okay so all that you take care of simply by cross connecting the wires or connecting the wires appropriately okay because you want a high pass response in the equalizer right so by changing these things you can change the uh tap weights This is actually quite convenient to uh, realize because uh, the delays are realized in a digital form. You can have more than uh, three taps. Many times you can have four, five taps also, right? And you can even have a tap that is far away. You don't have to implement all taps, right? You can have a number of taps and zeros that you don't have any differential pairs corresponding to them. And then after that, if you feel that you have to cancel it, you can add the tap. Okay. So. If this one, it's a lot easier to tailor the uh, response to whatever you want compared to the receive equalizer. Receive equalizer just gives you four and zero. It's some kind of two equalizer. Whereas this one, you can get the precise type of FIR response. This is okay. Any questions about this? Any disadvantages you see in this? Look through to be true. What I uh, would point to is, like, for instance, when you make a transmitter like this, let's say a differential pair loaded by a pair of resistor, it's the output voltage that is limited. Okay. So, what uh, problem do you foresee here? Huh? So, here, the, one of the problems, especially with this particular type of construction, uh, uh, is that. Uh, it's the sum of all these currents that goes through the resistor, right? So it's the worst case sum that will be limited. Okay. So let's say that in this particular case, you make a transmitter without equalization, and your I naught R is limited to 400 milliohm for whatever reason. Okay. So that's the limitation. Whatever reason meaning, you know what the reason is. So you need some amount of voltage across this, some amount of voltage across that for everything to work properly. And with all of that, with let's say one volt supply, you can get 400 millivolts at the output. Now, what happens if you add equalization? What will be the amplitude of the signal that you can send? Or what is the worst case output of the equalizer? We have a filter. What's the worst case output? Filter driven by a binary signal. So you have okay. This is the convolution, right? And let's say this is a binary 
signal meaning it's either plus or minus 1 okay what is the largest signal you can get out of this we have discussed this in the context of ISS. all basically this is the absolute sum of all of these things okay now uh, like i said this h minus 1 and h1 will be negative but as far as the worst case signal is concerned they add up in a positive way okay so if you are uh, let's say limited to 400 millivolts here this is in this case we have only the cursor this is f0 that is limited to 400 millivolts okay uh, whereas in this case with equalization h0 plus h1 plus h of minus 1 this is limited to 400 millivolts so what does this mean h0 has to be smaller right the signal that you send has to be smaller okay you understand this is like changing the gain of the uh, filter that is if you can accommodate more equalization but you have to reduce the dc gain itself okay so let me do it with uh, one particular uh, with a single tap example so let me first take a case where there is no equalization so that means i will just show it as a tap x0 okay so what will we be transmitting will be transmitting either plus h0 or minus h0 in response to the bits that we see okay so now i have a two tap equalizer two tap meaning i have let's say h0 and h1 and h1 is less than zero okay which is what i expect from a linear equalizer okay so if i have alternating bit pattern that is going through this filter what will i be transmitting well basically i have h1 plus h0 and minus h1 plus h0 and so on okay now let's say this uh, h0 is supposed to be i mean this h1 by h0 is half okay that is the cursor the post cursor isi can be half of the main time so then clearly this means that h0 can only be 1 by 1.5 times this one is this clear so now when this goes through a channel you will get an output signal whose amplitude is h0 for consecutive identical digits when this goes through this a uh, channel if it is equalized correctly again you will get only h0 because the other one will get cancelled out right but the amplitude will be smaller okay so just think about this basically adding more equalization taps in the transmitter with a voltage limit if you didn't have the voltage limit there is no problem but you understand that whenever you pass a signal through a filter right if you pass a binary signal through a filter then the worst case uh, maximum will increase with the number of taps okay as you go on increasing the number of taps the maximum is related to summation of uh, the absolute sum of all the impulse response elements okay and that will be if uh, you have a fixed voltage limit then each of the elements has to be scaled down the cursor has to be scaled down okay so this is the disadvantage of the transmit equalizer that is let's say you try to make it for six tap equalizer and this absolute sum becomes twice the cursor value then you can only send half the amplitude of what you could do uh, before right so even here you can't go crazy with it so this is this uh, limitation is nothing to do with crosstalk right this is just that even if you are able to implement all of these things you can't implement all kinds of uh, wild equalizers with the linear problem. that's the problem okay similar uh, limitations will come in the receiver in the receiver the gain is not the issue you can fix the dc gain but then the high frequency gain will go on increasing and it will keep amplifying even random noise okay so that's the problem right so for this for these reasons we will uh, explore the nonlinear equalizer we will explore the limitations of this a little more and we'll show that uh, regardless of uh, where you implement the uh, sometimes it's uh, 
mentioned in a confusing way that whether if you implement in the transmitter of this happens in the receiver and so on. But if you assume like one to identical channels, regardless of where you implement the equalizer, in the transmitter or in the receiver, you will have the same type of limitation, this linear equalizer. Okay. Any questions about this? Think about this. This is actually easy to sketch and see that if you have a fixed voltage limit, your cursor taps have to be formed. So what I suggest you do is you assume that your channel is versus an ideal channel. Now for this you would implement an equalizer which is 1 minus half the inverse whereas for this you wouldn't do anything it would just be 1. Now assuming that the transmitter amplitude is fixed you implement this one and that one let's say the transmitter output amplitude is 1 volt and then see what comes out of the channel the amplitude of the equalized data that comes out of the channel it will be very easy to see okay there's only a few minutes any questions?